Well, hello, everybody, and welcome once again. This is Syracuse Basketball Post Game, presented by Krause Health, the exclusive healthcare partner for SU Athletics. My name is Brent Dax, and we are coming to you after Syracuse drops its regular season finale. A four game winning streak comes to a close, and Syracuse's NCAA tournament chances all but come to a close, short of a magical run through the ACC tournament. Getting to the ACC tournament championship game may not be enough. Syracuse, I think their only chance is to win the ACC tournament. We'll see. Weirder things have happened, but no matter what, a deep run is absolutely necessary for Syracuse in the ACC tournament. They really needed this game, and they did not get it. Clemson, 90 Syracuse 75 Clemson sweeps the season series from the orange on their senior night for PJ Hall and a number of players weird to see uh, Joe Girard have another senior night at Clemson and Girard was on point once again very similar to the first game at Syracuse he had 18 points very efficient shooting night in that game at the dome same thing tonight with 21 points PJ Hall and Scheffler for Shefflin, pardon me, for Clemson. Just too much to overcome in the paint. Shefflin with 16 points and 16 rebounds. He was a perfect 5 of 5 from the field, so he did not miss a shot against Syracuse this entire season. 10 of 10 in those two games, 5 of 5 at the free throw line. Absolutely crushed Syracuse inside. P.J. Hall scored 21 of his 25 points in the first half. Syracuse shifted to a zone. It actually did slow him down for a while, but the size disparity in this game, as we will talk about, which is way too much for Syracuse to overcome. For the Orange, uh, Judah Mintz led with 20 points. We'll kind of go over his numbers in his game and how it's it's the Judah Mintz you don't want to see in terms of how many shots he had to take and what the offense, in this case, wasn't doing in this game. Quadier Copeland with 17 points off the bench for the Orange. A lot of that damage done in the first half. Malik Brown, who did all he could to guard uh, Shefflin and P.J. Hall in the paint, he's only one guy, can only handle so much, but he ends up with another double-double, 12 points and 11 rebounds for a guy that's just asked to do so much for Syracuse, just couldn't do enough in the paint tonight. So we'll go over a few things here. We'll go over this game. We'll look at the chances for Syracuse in the NCAA tournament, although that's not much of a conversation now beyond having to win the ACC tournament, in my opinion, maybe if they get to the title game, but... The committee, you just don't want to leave them a window to not put you in. I think it's it's an automatic bid or nothing at this point. A lot of our Syracuse sports insiders, and we're going to hear from them coming up here shortly, already starting to kind of peek over the horizon to next year, what the NIT would do for Syracuse. Is it worth going to the NIT? And I think a lot of people like what they saw from Syracuse down the stretch. And, you know, this this is the end of the regular season, so it's natural to look back and and kind of reminisce, if you will, on the season itself because it's all one and done territory for Syracuse from here on out. So there's a mix of you're telling me there's a chance if they win the ACC tournament, but certainly reflecting on Adrian Autry's first year as head coach and looking over the horizon with the transfer portal and NIL and the world as it is today, what players come back, which ones don't. So uh, Syracuse fans with a lot on their minds here, and you're going to have a long wait because the ACC tournament does not start until the week from today. Syracuse cannot get the double buy, so you're going to be waiting around to see what bid Syracuse gets in terms of a seed. Is it? Uh, it's going to be tough for them to get the five seed, in my opinion. But will they end up as the six seed, the seven seed? They'll definitely uh, play on Wednesday and try and win four games to get to the NCAA tournament, which is going to be a tall task at this point. Tall task for anybody, frankly, but uh, a tall task for a team that, that's got some flaws that would prevent it from winning four straight games. In that circumstance, though, they did win four straight games coming into this one tonight. So let's go over a few of those things, and then we'll hear from our Syracuse Sports Insiders coming up here. So we mentioned it. Look, the paint was dominated by Clemson. You look at the numbers, 38-26 points in the paint. It felt much bigger than that with what Shefflin and uh, P.J. Hall were doing. Hunter steps in, and it was a mix for Clemson. First half, they dominated in the paint. Syracuse could not stop them. In the second half, Clemson goes 7 of 12 from the three-point line. And Syracuse actually hit its first, I think, eight shots in the first half. They were doing what they needed to offensively, but my fear about the Syracuse team, and I mentioned this even through the four-game winning streak and, what was it, six of eight that they won coming into tonight, 
is that you got to make stops if you're truly going to be a good team in March. And Syracuse's defense is so reliant on transition, on getting steals, on disrupting. It, Clemson had 10 turnovers tonight. The Orange did get 11 points off those turnovers, but just four steals uh, for Syracuse, which is so reliant. They need seven, eight, nine steals to get in that transition defense because they're just not a D that's set up to make stops and go the other way. They had to switch to the zone to slow down P.J. Hall, and you just didn't see enough of it tonight. So paint uh, was a big problem for the Orange tonight. Another issue for Syracuse was they couldn't get Chris Bell open, and I give uh, Clemson a lot of credit. I like Brad Brownell a lot. I think he's a great coach. Clemson is clearly going to the NCAA tournament, and I think that team can really do some damage, especially if they play the way they did tonight, an inside-out game. They are a tough team to match up with, and we'll see what kind of seed they get, and it's all about the bracket and what kind of matchups you get, but I think that could be a dangerous team in the tournament. But Brownell knows how hot Chris Bell has been, particularly from the outside in recent games. He just saw Syracuse recently. When he talked about Syracuse in his post-game press conference, after that game, a lot of it was about Joe Girard, of course, and his return to the Dome. But some coaches you are just smarter than others, and they, they pay attention to detail more. And you could just tell, like, this guy knows Syracuse and what they do, and he can watch film, he can see the trends. And in this game, he knew he had to cut off Chris Bell. Bell really struggled to get open. I think that it's partially, just looking at the numbers here, it's seven points, two of six you can't have Chris Bell only taking six shots in this game. Four rebounds for him in 37 minutes. He's been such an offensive catalyst for this team, opening things up for this team offensively. And I think Brownell came in and said, hell or high water, he's not getting the ball. Now, that being said, I think i got to go back to something that we've been critical at times of Adrian Autry this year, and he pushed back on this in one of his recent press conferences when he said, you know, do you want us to run plays or do you want us to play basketball? And I'm paraphrasing here, but... I mean, when Syracuse was at its best, it's almost like jazz. They're improv out there. They're moving the basketball. It's not set plays. It's not something you could predict. It's just, if anything, it's unpredictable because it's a free-flowing offense. The problem with that is when somebody disrupts it like they did tonight, Syracuse fell back into old habits. When Judah Mintz is 8 of 21 from the field, 0 of 4 from three-point range, you can't have Judah Mintz taking that many shots. Someone had to try and facilitate the offense. He actually made a few at the beginning of the second half, but you're in the danger zone there when Judah's taking 21 shots, and then you look across the board. Quadier with 13. They shot off Bell, who only took six shots. Um, J.J. Starling came out uh, like he was shot out of a cannon in this game, but then really fell off after that. He finishes 4 of 8. Justin Taylor, a donut tonight, no points, pretty much zeros across the board other than two rebounds in 15 minutes in this game. So his recent strength, it's hard to get around the basket with, you know, Hall and Shefflin in, in the paint. I understand that, but you know, Justin Taylor just fell back into those box scores we saw before this winning streak where he just wasn't contributing anything on the offensive end or really anywhere tonight for Syracuse. So what you need to do in that case to go back to what I was saying a moment ago, you got to run plays. You got to run screens. You got to try and spring Chris Bell free. You've got this is where I, what I brought up a moment ago. Brownell had a much better game plan tonight. He outcoached Adrian Autry tonight. And that's where your whole thing about wanting to play basketball and being in that free flow and, you know, do you want us to run plays and, and that forceful pushback that Autry had bit him tonight because you want to feel like in a game like this that you emptied. Everything out, the old expression, everything in the kitchen sink to win this game. And I don't get that feeling. They did switch defenses. They did press at the end. I felt they should have pressed a little earlier than that, as I mentioned how reliant they are and transition defense. The crowd's on top of you. Yeah, we'll get to the crowd, by the way. And my God, my ears are still ringing from that crowd at Clemson. I don't blame them, by the way. They're into the game, and certainly you want a home crowd to be into a game, especially on senior night. But, man, ESPN, epic fail tonight with that microphone putting Reese Davis and Sean Barnum right in the student section, that shrieking girl that was next to that broadcast crew right there. It, it, it was unbearable. It was unbearable to have that sound coming through the TV all night. I had to mute it several times. I don't like to do that because I like to hear the broadcasters and get the feel of what's going on when you're watching a broadcast. Like, but it was it was unbearable. And the fact that ESPN let that happen all night is is just it's a shame that they, that they did that. They're better than that. I get they're in a spot because 
the crowd, I'm rambling about this now, but while we're on the subject, it, it wasn't like it was a crowd mic. It was just the microphone, you know, the headset mic that Reese Davis and Sean Barnum were using because they're literally in the student section. And the students that were right next to them were passionate fans. Good for them. But get them the hell away from the fans. That was un... I could not believe ESPN2 in this case, but an ESPN broadcast. Let that go for 40 minutes. That was just an epic fail on their part. Rant over about that, but come on, you can't do that. There's a difference between natural sound and kind of getting the feel of it and just earpiece, ear piercing. It's like that scene from Dumb and Dumber. You want to hear the most annoying sound in the world? And I won't even do the sound because all our ears are shot from having to listen to that crap all night. Okay, anyway, I'll, I'm done ranting about that. But Clemson just got off to this big start. There was only one lead change in this game, only two ties in this game. Syracuse was playing catch up the whole way, and Clemson just kept hitting shots. There was a point when they got within five, and then Clemson goes down on the other end, hits a three-pointer. I mentioned how well Clemson shot from the three-point line in the second half. They just had an answer all night. They had a counterpunch for every punch that Syracuse threw at them, and this is where Syracuse has been a good first-half team this year, and particularly in the streak that they've been in. But even just that stretch it was 16 to 5 18 to 5 Syracuse roars back they get within two but every time it was 30 to 28 it was uh, 56 51 every time Hall would score Gerard with his tactically timed threes Hunter came alive from the three-point line uh for Clemson he ends up with 17 points on his senior night and look that's the difference in an experienced team Clemson has been there they have done that remember they got snubbed Out of the tournament last year, they're hungry to get there. They're in. I mean, they've got a great resume. They are unequivocally in the tournament. But you've got seniors that have been there. I mean, P.J. Hall's a legend in in Clemson terms. I mean, he's one of the most, you know, uh, beloved players they'll ever have, frankly. But senior experience in Girard and players that have come into the program, that's the difference in what we saw tonight. So kind of mixing in what Syracuse looks at now because the NCAA tournament only comes if they win the ACC tournament, right? Right. How many of these super sophomores, if you will, a team just (laughs) everywhere you look filled with sophomores, comes back, right? How much will it benefit this team in all likelihood going to the NIT? I'd love to be wrong about that. Let's see another like 2006-like run through a conference tournament and get this team in the NCAA tournament because that's what we all want to see. That's what I'd rather watch. That's what you'd rather watch, and it'd be a hell of a story if they did it, right? But in all likelihood, you're thinking about the NIT, and sometimes the NIT is just not worth it. It's just not. Even if you get the invite, like it, it, you're always kind of wondering. It's kind of like a, a six and six football team that goes to a bowl game. Do they really want to be there? Syracuse, <laughs> we forget with all the euphoria surrounding Fran Brown and company, they got trucked by South Florida in that bowl game. There was reasons for that, injuries and all sorts of things that that went into that. But you always have to question like motivation, right? Would it benefit this team to go to the NIT? Because who of those players that would get that experience are going to be back on this roster next year by virtue of Judah Mintz is probably going to make a go of it at the pros, whether you think he gets drafted or not. I mean, he's going to test the waters again. Transfer portal, who goes into the portal, who goes to the highest bidder like Jesse Edwards did last year to West Virginia, which didn't pay off for him basketball-wise. It paid off for him in his wallet, certainly, but West Virginia finish below 500 and it's they're not even gonna make the nit for all that matters and that's the kind of player that syracuse needed tonight so jesse i get it you would have got what six hundred thousand dollars here you got a little bit more money to go to west virginia and look uh that's america for you somebody made a better deal and you took it financially and you know that's your choice but you would be on a team where i think you would have been good for two or three wins which certainly would have made a huge difference in a game like this and i think we're having a different conversation about what kind of team this is So you're thinking about that and what the benefit of the NIT is, but now that we're at the end of the road of the regular season here, for Adrian Autry to get over the 20-win mark, which had not been done in the regular season until uh, since uh, Syracuse's first year in the ACC, so a decade, they finished with 11 conference wins. That has not happened since that first year in the ACC as well, when Syracuse went 14-4 and in the ACC. I think by and large, you're going to see this from our our comments from our Syracuse Sports Insiders coming up. 
I think by and large, people are like, okay, there's some flaws. There's some things you have to address in the portal. You see what Donnie Freeman, who is just one of the best incoming prospects Syracuse has had in, I mean, you can say it since Carmelo. I'll say it. He's in the McDonald's All-American game. He's in the Jordan Classic. He's the number one rated power forward in his class. The numbers he's putting up, the talent, what he brings to the table is exactly what Syracuse needs in the paint, a true paint presence, a true forward at his position to come in. He's an instant starter. He will absolutely be in the starting lineup next year for this team. Elijah Moore, the other big recruit coming in, who's a great shooter. You kind of wonder what kind of backcourt combinations you have if Judah moves on. In all likelihood, he will. You'd Quadir, JJ, Moore, if Kyle Cuff returns. There's a lot of ifs that come with this, right? We'll have plenty of time in the offseason to really settle that out. But going to the NIT, what kind of experience does that bring? But also, what kind of team comes back on the other side based on just everything that college basketball is these days. So something to think about, and we're going to have a lot of time to think about these things because the ACC tournament is over a week away, and these players are going to have time to think about it. But as I said, by and large, I think the feeling is good. You win four in a row at the end of the season, six of eight. They just, if you look at the whole body of work, and we spent a lot of time talking about that going into this game, knowing that Syracuse needed it to really put a quality win in its back pocket, There were just too many quality games Syracuse got blown out in. There was a stretch, remember, when Syracuse had lost, what was it, five or six games this year by 18. They were losing by like an average of 20 points per game, right? There was the turnaround after the Wake Forest game, and Autry has that firm pound his fist on the podium type of press conference where he really laid it out there. Dismiss Benny Williams from the team. Let's not forget the injuries this team has had, how shorthanded he was. You know, Autry could not talk enough with a smile on his face before the season began about playing eight, nine, ten guys. The two narratives that shifted under Autry were he's going to go deeper on the bench and he's going to play man to man defense. They ended up having to go back to the zone for a myriad of reasons at the end of the year. And he couldn't go deep on the bench because he, he didn't have the bodies, right? Naheem McLeod gets hurt. Chance Westry gets hurt. There's a name right there, by the way. Chance Westry in this rotation next year and the lift he's going to give this team. I think kind of a Quadir Copeland-esque lift off the bench next year for this team. So, you know, don't forget about him coming back in next year and whatever else they they bring in from the portal and the comings and goings there. You kind of have to keep an open mind on that. Peter Carey, of course, in and out of the lineup. Like, this team was down to the rotation you see now and unfortunately justin taylor just didn't provide enough you wonder if he transfers out in the offseason to go somewhere where he'll play he'll be more productive and that was the thing like you've got shefflin in there and you've got justin taylor like look at the size disparity okay 6 10 382 <laughs> that's a little too much it sounds like an offensive lineman there 6 10 238 pound pj hall 6 foot 8 238 pound ian shefflin against Malik Brown, who, God bless him for his size and everything he's done in the paint, puts up numbers, but he's 6'6", 218. He's given up 20 pounds to both of those guys. Justin Taylor, complete mismatch, trying to guard one of those guys. And then when Quadir was in, 6'6", 200 pounds. So he's got the length, certainly. He's got the athleticism, but Syracuse just needs a paint presence. That is a huge priority to put Malik back at the four, and Donnie Freeman's a big player. He's a freshman. He still has some some growing to do and certainly some some maturing to do, and you know somebody that's got to get used to the college game as, as the, the raw talent is off the charts if you've seen him play. But look, that's what was the story of this game tonight, and I think that's got to be the priority in the portal. And much like offensive linemen in college football, we're not talking about a dime a dozen here, guys. There's only so many premium centers, premium big men, in the portal but that has got to be a priority just given that Syracuse they did all they could to get around it but there are certain teams that come right in and expose it I know Syracuse uh, beat North Carolina but Baycott and players like that PJ Hall and a couple other big men that just had their way with the orange and the pink because they just can't counter it and think of how careful Malik had to be trying to stay out of foul trouble and again still getting double doubles so 
it's it's a weird feeling to be a Syracuse fan. Because again, I think by and large, people are encouraged. They got over the twenty win mark. They see this going somewhere. They fought to the end. They were in the conversation for the NCAA tournament. I remember at the beginning of the season, distinctly saying because everybody was curious about you know what do you, what would be a, a successful season for Syracuse basketball in Autry's first year. And I remember my answer was, if we're talking in early March and they are in the conversation for the NCAA tournament, I think that's all you can ask for. Just get in the darn tournament and go from there. And they were right to the end. And they're technically still in the conversation. They just have to go really deep into the ACC tournament, which I think is going to be difficult for this team to do. But uh, there's still a crack in the window if they can do it and pull a Jerry McNamara and win a conference tournament that they have to win in order to get into the NCAA tournament. So kind of a weird feeling, right? They didn't play their best in the game that they needed, but big picture, I think people see where it's going, know some things have to be tweaked, but I think uh, generally uh, high marks for Adrian Autry. Felicia Leggett jack won the ACC Coach of the Year on the women's side today. Uh, shameless plug, she was uh, one of our recent guests on the Syracuse Sports Podcast. So everybody that subscribes and listens on Spotify, Apple, YouTube, and the same feed that you get this post game show. If you hadn't had an opportunity to hear that conversation with Coach Jack, go check it out. She was fantastic, as she always is. There were some rumbles that I think Autry could be in the mix for ACC Coach of the Year. I think he had to win this game to kind of seal that deal. I don't think he's going to get there now. He'll certainly get votes. And I think people will recognize like, this is a team that was picked to finish 10th in the ACC. And they're going to finish, depending on you know how things shake out here. Five, six, maybe seventh they'll fall to, but no matter where they finish, it's going to be a few spots ahead of where most people projected them to be. So maybe not coach of the year material, but uh, but certainly recognized by and large for a job well done, right? All right, let us uh, jump in here and see what our Syracuse Sports Insiders are saying about this one. And we would love for you to become a Syracuse Sports Insider, meaning you can text me, I can text you guys. Today was an amazing day. To be, uh, to frankly, to be me and see all the text coming in as a Syracuse uh, sports insider and what you provided today. So just uh, while we were killing time today and everybody's got nervous energy before this game, I just sent out a text to our, our Syracuse sports insiders. And I said, guys, forget about Lenardi. Forget about the net rankings, which are trash, by the way. We could do a whole show on that. Forget about metrics and analytics and <laughs> bracketology. What do you think Syracuse has to do to make the NCAA tournament. I got over a hundred responses within an hour. Just people like, bam, here's what I think. They got to win these games. It just, it, I was just, can I just say this? I was so proud of you guys. I really was. I was like, we're having a moment here. We've built this community. You, you asked the right question and man, the response, I could not keep up with it. That they just kept coming. They're still coming in. I mean, they'll slow down now. The game's over, but that's what being a Syracuse Sports Insider is all about. Being a part of questions like that, your opinions, your thoughts, your questions, your uh, all that focused here on this post game show and the Syracuse Sports Podcast. Become a Syracuse Sports Insider today. We are growing a great community of Syracuse sports fans. And we would love for you to be a part of it. Here's how you do it, by the way. You text the word orange to 315 847 3895. You get a link, you sign up, and a cool thing is you get to try it free for two weeks. Check it out. See if you like it, and then it's just $3.99 a month after your free 14-day trial. So there's my little pitch for the Syracuse Sports Insiders. Uh, we had a great day today. I know they're not the result that you wanted, but still, uh, this growing community of Syracuse fans that we have, is uh, it, today was awesome to, to see that happen, and uh, I really, really appreciate all your feedback on that, and I appreciate the feedback we're about to get here. I love this one to start off from Cooper, who says, in the words of Coach Brown from the movie Major League, the only thing left to do is win the whole bleeping thing. Let's go. Slight correction there, Cooper. It was Jake Taylor who said that. Not the, the legend Lou Brown. But, I mean, Lou Brown, come on. How would you like to manage the Indians this year? I don't know. I got another guy on the line about some white walls. I'll get back to you, Charlie. It's almost baseball season. Annual viewing of Major League coming up soon. Drew K says, if this is how Syracuse plays basketball with so much on the line, 
and the team deserves to sit out the tournament. Ooh, harsh. Brian H. says, good grief. Bad on the defensive side of the ball sometimes. There were multiple trips down the floor where Clemson got whatever shot they wanted to get. And it wasn't just, that's a good point, Brian. It wasn't just you couldn't handle Hall and Shefflin inside. Like the rotations on defense what weren't what they needed to be. Clemson really moved the ball well tonight. You said it. What did their assist numbers end up here? I don't think I noted that earlier. So Clemson had 17 assists on 32 field goals. So about half. I honestly thought it would be more than that. Syracuse had nine assists on 28 field goals. Just goes to show you they didn't move the ball as well and the difficulties they had in that department tonight. Uh, Add in here by Brian. Very good ball reversal by them. Very poor defensive rotations by us from Dan P who says lack of a true big man hurts too bad when not shooting the lights out have what it takes to win but not consistently played a good game but the better team won tonight Claire uh, hits on what we were kind of talking about before we started hearing from our Syracuse sports insiders saying disappointed yes but if the success metric this year was to rebuild then I say that Syracuse is heading in the right direction from Glenn B who texted our Syracuse Sports Insider line at 315-847-3895 and said, just not playing team ball. Seems they don't even look to pass off, but then not much is going on with play without the ball. The basics seem to be missing. Yeah, they just didn't move as well tonight. And again, I think Clemson deserves some credit for that. I think the way they got after Chris Bell, took Chris Bell out of it, all of a sudden, you take out that part of that rotation, and that's why you see Judah Mintz having to take 21 shots. That's why you see the offense stall, because Bell was such a big catalyst of it. And Bell, who had evolved from a catch-and-shoot three-point guy in the corner, he had a great shot when he did spring free, a rare instance tonight, top of the key. It wasn't for lack of Bell trying to get open. I just don't think they did a good enough job to get him open. I don't think they made enough adjustments to get him open there. And it just goes to show you how he was such a key cog in what Syracuse did in its four-game winning streak, six of eight, and how he just really uh, put a charge into the offense in recent games. From Matt D, who says, two super seniors, a senior and a junior, beat us tonight. Unfortunately, the better team won. We started clicking just a little too late this season. But he adds this, I wholeheartedly believe this program is heading in the right direction under Autry. Rich says, uh, love our super sophomores, but can't replace experience and the strength of seniors and juniors. Let's hope most of this group stays together. From Steve B says, I'm not usually a fan of make the NIT get the experience, but with this team, all sophomores, I don't see us losing the whole group. I think it could be beneficial. I go back and forth on it. I think ultimately, I think it would benefit this team. I think enough people will be back next year. It'll kind of grow the hunger. It reminds me of the women's team, you know, bringing it up earlier from Coach Jack winning the ACC Coach of the Year today. That women's team got so close last year. That NIT was a huge experience for them. Kind of put the hunger in them to come back and knowing how important it is to make the NCAA tournament. They're in the NCAA tournament. That's important to note, by the way, guys. There is a Syracuse basketball team in the NCAA tournament. This, the, the Coach Jack's women's team is going to be there. The only thing left to determine is how deep they go as a three seed and with the double bye in the ACC tournament and if they can get a home game at the JMA Wireless Dome and if they get put on the side of the bracket where the path to the regional in Albany is in play. So, yeah, this team more than likely is not going to be there, but the women's team is firmly in the tournament and could really make a, a, a deep run based on matchups, if they get the home games, and if Albany is in play, right? So keep that in mind, right? There certainly will be March Madness around here one way or the other. From Kay, who says, Despite all, I like our players. Too bad we have no center, no upperclassmen, and do not have a consistent three-point shooter. Bell, again, had a bad night. From Gabe, who says, Well, Clemson is the only team to sweep us. Good news is they lose a few key big seniors next year so now Syracuse has an odd bye week before the tournament the whole time to uh, and I think I cut him off a little bit I think it was to sit around and kind of ponder what goes on next week shout out to Gabe by the way who recognized this great album that I keep on the shelf here Rotting Pinata from uh, my favorite 90s band Sponge right some of the easter eggs we put up here if you guys can 
spot what's going on behind me here. Some of it's pretty obvious, right? Bruce Springsteen staring into your soul, right? There's something to look forward to as well. Bruce, JMA Dome, April 18th. Let's go. We're getting closer. Uh, let's see here from Ryan. This is new when they uh, had to do tonight, but no answers on the defensive end in a tough road environment is a loss every time. Need to win it all now in D.C. if they want to dance. Ah, uh, yes, go ACC in Washington, D.C. Uh, for the season overall, a 20-win regular season for the first time in a decade is a nice step in the right direction. And Ryan adds, I hope that Red can build on this. And Frank will close us off tonight uh, from the Syracuse Sports Insider saying, Axe, regarding SU's chances next week, I leave you with the immortal words of John Blutarski. Nothing is over until we decide it is. Was it over when the Germans bombed Pearl Harbor? Hell no. I feel like I need to say this. Yes, we know who bombed Pearl Harbor. It's a line from a movie. If you've not seen Animal House, you're very confused right now. As the kids would say, if you know, you know. So save the emails. It's not a historical inaccuracy. I certainly know what happened in Pearl Harbor, December 7th, 1941. It's from a movie, all right? Because I, I, every time that line comes up, I get an email from somebody. It's Animal House, Butarski, right? Don't get me going on Animal House lines. I was already rattling off some lines from Major League earlier tonight, right? So, yeah, now we wait. We wait for the ACC tournament. Syracuse has a lot of time to think, a lot of time to sharpen the edges. Got to see how the bracket plays out. Their fate is out of their hands, in terms of had they got this win tonight and now you'll only i think at syracuse won tonight i think they only had to win two in the acc tournament and they i think they would have been in now they the only way they control their own destiny now is to win the acc tournament maybe if they get to the championship game i don't want to discount that let's see what the bracket looks like what those wins would look like that's four wins and that's three wins to get there four if you win it is there a North Carolina included in there? Who are the teams? There are enough quality wins in there to add to the resume. But see, there's a, so look, tell you what about Lenardi and some of these bracketologists. There's a, a stack of teams ahead of Syracuse that have to fall by the wayside. There's bid stealers out there, right? From some one bid leagues that where you have to win the conference tournament that could sneak in there and take some bids. That's the helpless feeling this time of the year. When you don't control your own destiny and you're counting on other teams, you're seeing where your seat is in, in the ACC tournament, and the only thing you have left to do, as Frank said, is win the whole darn thing. So until then, we wait, and we wait, and we wait. But can you believe the season, uh, the regular season is over? And who knows how many games Syracuse has left here? At this point last year, think of the conversation we were having about – the change in coaching and just everything that came from that. And Syracuse only played one game in the ACC tournament. They lost to Wake Forest, and then the conversation took on a whole different tenor. We're here a year later. Autry's the coach, and I think, by and large, the general feeling is, okay, strong first year, build on it. Let's see where they go from here. Again, still a few games left potentially here in both the ACC tournament and more than likely the NIT for this team. But, whew. Time flies when you're having fun, man. I can't believe it's March already, and we're talking about uh, the end of a Syracuse basketball season. So uh, we will be doing this postgame show after every game that Syracuse does in the ACC tournament and potential NIT slash NCAA tournament thing. So we, I don't know how many shows we have left, but we certainly have a couple uh, at the very least, at least one you know, in the ACC tournament. I, I would think one NIT game, right? So we'll be doing that, but we don't know when the end of the show will come in essence. So uh, let me just take a moment to thank you for hanging with us throughout the season, being a part of the post-game show, being a part of our Syracuse Sports Insider community, and being here game in and game out. I know I missed a few games this year, had a couple health issues and a couple things going on, uh, so I wasn't here as much as I'd like to be, frankly, in some games that I missed, but uh, the ones that I was here for and... Uh, you guys are great. It just hearing and seeing from some of the same voices and how this becomes you know kind of a routine for you to be here. Uh, how often were we staying up really late? I know for some of you, it's, you know, that, that's the great thing about this. We get people watching from all over the place, right? So 
if you're on the West Coast, you don't care what time it is. But for those on the East Coast or wherever the case may be, you know, sometimes we're staying up really late doing this thing and you guys were there through it all. And if you didn't uh, get a chance to be a part of it live, you'd always catch up on YouTube or on the, on the podcast. And we just got a lot of great feedback about the show this year. And I, I thank you from the bottom of my heart, being there game in a game out with you know, your comments, your opinions, and just keeping the conversation going. There's no way we do this without you guys. And I just want to thank you for, for being a part of it all season long here. And uh, we'll keep uh, plugging away as far as Syracuse goes in its uh, one-and-done postseason here, starting with whatever their first matchup is in the ACC tournament. But we got about a week until that happens, a lot of time to sit around and think about it. In the meantime, shameless plugs, okay? Syracuse Sports Podcast. ACC Coach of the Year, Felicia Legat jack That came out today. We recently had on a number of great guests that you may have missed last week, bracketologist Patrick Stevens. Kelly Gramlich from the ACC Network, terrific women's basketball analyst. Rick Beardsley, four-time All-American, great lacrosse conversation. Later this week, you're going to hear from Kevin Connors of ESPN, college basketball, college football studio host, unabashed Syracuse fan, by the way, Ithaca College grad, really cool guy. He's actually got a a role in the new EA Sports college football game that uh, college football fans are just chomping at the bit to be a part of. Eric Devendorf will be on the pod later this week. A lot to talk about with Devo. So we're humming on the Syracuse Sports Podcast, and we got some big plans for the offseason. It's like, oh, what are you doing the offseason when the, the Orange aren't playing? Oh, we got we got some stuff planned for you. I don't want to give it all away here, but we are going to have a lot of fun. So please subscribe on Spotify, Apple, wherever you get your podcasts, certainly on YouTube as well. Make sure you are subscribed to our YouTube channel, Syracuse Orange Sports on syracuse.com so whenever we have a new syracuse sports podcast pop up you don't miss it it's there and we got a lot of fun things planned for you so shameless plugs there be a part of the podcast and spring football is coming emily liker and i can have some fun with that on the podcast and in other places so yeah basketball season's winding down but boy we mentioned the women's teams are going to be Hopefully making a deep run in the tournament. Lacrosse is humming. Uh, spring football's coming. There's 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 a lot around the bend here, guys. And we'll be all over it on Syracuse Sports and, of course, on Syracuse.com. But what do you say we uh, end it there for tonight? Uh, Syracuse finishes the regular season, losing to Clemson 90-75. to Their NCAA tournament hopes uh, on life support at this point. But weirder things have happened, guys. As John Rothstein likes to say, this is March. So we'll see if Syracuse can pull a rabbit out of their hat and make a deep run in the ACC tournament. For now, I'm Brent Axe. This has been Syracuse Basketball Postgame presented by Krausel. Thank you, guys. We'll talk to you again next time. Thanks for being here tonight.